The Apostle John wrote, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word. And through the centuries, that Word has been communicated through person, through the spoken Word, through the written Word, and today now through the internet, TV, radio, so many different ways. Communicating the Gospel, coming up next. Hello, I'm Gary Krauss and welcome to today's program. Coming to you today from the city of Mainz on the Rhine River in Germany. Mainz, of course, is very famous for being the home for the invention of the movable type press. This caused a revolution. For the first time, ideas were, being, were able to be spread throughout the region very quickly, very swiftly. The inventor, of course, was Johannes Gutenberg. It was the early 1450s, and it was this invention that helped the ideas of the Reformation to spread throughout Europe very quickly. Of course, the Gutenberg Bible, the first full book that was used on these printing presses, is now a very rare and very valuable book. On today's program, we'll be looking at publishing and how in the 1800s, the Seventh-day Adventist Church began to share its message through the printed word. Let's look at this story now. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was born as a direct fulfillment of prophecy. It did not see itself as a denomination, but as a movement with a mission. In fact, it resisted organizational structure and restraint. The leaders and members believed in the soon return of Christ. They used every means necessary to spread the news of the imminent return of Jesus. A lot of people had gotten so excited that they abandoned their businesses. They left fields and crops untended and unharvested. New England winters require preparation, and that preparation simply hadn't been done. People thought they were going to heaven in October. Instead, they wouldn't have food to eat or money for several months. Disappointment might not be a strong enough word. In the words of one Millerite, true believers had given up all for Christ but he did not come. And now to turn again to the cares, perplexities, and dangers of life in full view of jeering and reviling unbelievers who scoffed as never before was a terrible trial of faith and patience. A Methodist paper called for thunderbolts read with uncommon wrath upon the head of Joshua Himes and other Millerites. Critics accused him of being a liar, a fearmongerer, disturber of the peace, and a cheat. Some said Himes fled the country. Some said he committed suicide. The Boston Post called the Advent leaders unprincipled men, perfectly conscious of the absurdity of their opinions and reckless of the injury they caused. In reality, Himes, Miller, and other leaders of the movement had never instructed believers to leave their jobs, sell their property, and neglect their secular responsibilities. But their faith turned them into social pariahs. William Miller himself wrote, it passed, and the next day it seemed as though all the demons from the bottomless pit were loose upon us. Hiram Edson lamented, Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heaven, no golden home city, no paradise? Is all this but a cunningly devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hope and expectation of these things? Luther Boutel said, Everyone felt lonely with hardly a desire to speak to anyone. All were silent, save to inquire, where are we? And what's next? All were housed in searching their Bibles to learn what to do. Then Hiram Edson receives a vision while walking through a field. Reinterpretation offers new hope. Early church founders want to share that hope with the believers they had lost. Ellen Harmon White is shown in a vision that James White should start a magazine. Penniless but inspired, James convinces a publisher to print 1,000 copies of The Present Truth. The magazine helps clarify what happened in 1844, and the full cost is repaid by generous readers. 
publishing ministry quickly becomes central to spreading emerging Adventist doctrines like the Three Angels' Message and Sabbath Truth. To keep printers from running on the Sabbath, the church starts its own publishing house, which was literally a house that early church members lived and worked in together. Hiram Edson sold his farm and donated the money to buy a hand press. Soon the church began distributing the Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. Since there was no paper cutter, Uriah Smith trimmed all the edges of the magazines with his penknife. In his own words, we blistered our hands in the operation, and often the tracks and form were not half so true and square as the doctrines they taught. At age 23, Smith would go on to serve as editor and would hold the position in some capacity for his entire life. As the publishing ministry grows, young Canadian immigrant George King comes up with the idea to sell subscriptions of Adventist publications. Signs of the Times is born. The gospel message spills out of the church and meets people right at their front door. The beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist church was exciting. Was it something the pioneers could keep secret? Not a chance. Church pioneers assumed that those who renewed their belief would share with their brothers and sisters. The brothers and sisters would share with their cousins, and the cousins would share with their brothers and sisters, and the whole Great Commission would fulfill itself. But it didn't work out that way. My guest is Pastor Klaus Popper, who is the general manager for Stimme de Hoffmann, the Adventist Media Center here in Germany. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And we're actually kind of on the roof of Stimme, and it's a big building here containing many types of ministries. Can you explain some of the, the ministries you're involved in? You know, we are doing uh, television, Hope Channel Deutsch. We are involved in the radio ministry that actually started in 1948. So it's right after the Second World War. Yes. A few years later, we began with radio ministry. Then the Bible Correspondence School was initiated which uh, up to today is working and um, um, mainly serving uh, the German-speaking uh, countries. Um, and then a uh, few years later, uh, it's actually about 50, 51 years old now, this uh, ministry is the Sight Impaired Ministry. That's uh, also a wide range of people that we serve with audio literature, audio books, audio magazines. Wonderful. Now, when you look at the various ministries you're involved in, how would you describe your audience? You know, the, the audience is actually pretty mixed, pretty mixed, um, and it's growing, uh, especially due to the Hope Channel. Uh, we started the production or audio-video production back in the 90s uh, in, during the satellite evangelism period. But 24-7, uh, we began seven years ago. So uh, I sometimes say when I will, when I'll, uh, Finish with preschooling and starting starting really going to school first grade uh, after seven years of experience. So we build a wide wide audience of many many people. But we can say that those that listen and watch us and participate in the Bible correspondence schools are mostly uh, non-Adventists. Many of them non-Christian background. So how does that affect the type of programming that you produce? Um, we very intentionally try to reach a non-Christian audience, which is, sometimes makes it difficult to translate faith, because yes. faith is something that is you know, very, very old, that has come to us from our forefathers, uh, not only our Adventist forefathers, but uh, you know, back, back, back way in the days. Uh, so um, to translate it, uh, this faith into a, to a modern audience, to a postmodern audience, to a secular audience, is at times not easy, but this is our intention to speak in a way, to speak about faith and life in a way that people can really adopt it and make it practical in their lives. Now, you've engaged in various types of experiments of different things. Not so long ago, you had a combination of some outreach meetings and a feature film. Describe that project. Yeah, this was, uh, you know, the so-called Faith Simple series, and that I think the name really says it. We try to make faith very simple, very practical, um, to really come from a, from a, actually from the streets. We were not in a studio setting mm -hmm. uh, for delivering uh, the content, but on the streets in, in New York. That's, uh, that was the iconic place for, uh, actually for the whole world, but especially for postmodern people. 
So that's where we were on location delivering the different topics. We included a feature film that we produced as part of that series and you know did little bits of that film uh, of this story that we told there um, uh, were part of every evening program that we had at the beginning. So we started with this consecutive story um, where the story then happened again in New York. Mm. We were on location delivering uh, short messages of about you know, 12 to 17 minutes and then had guests in studio then, um, live production with uh, two, three guests that we then discussed the topic of that day, heavily involving social media, you know, counseling, and you know, it was a very integrative and comprehensive approach to media, uh, to evangelism actually, through media. So why don't you just stand in front of the camera and preach Adventist sermons? You know, that's, of course, this, this is a way to, 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 to speak to people, and uh, if it's a good sermon, nothing against a good sermon. <laughs> but uh, yeah, of course. But we felt that being on the streets, being where the people are, one, one of, the, of the topics, I was in a New York taxi and just driving this taxi, getting in the, into the taxi, speaking like I would speak with you here. Right. And then, you know, getting out after 12 minutes and going my way. So it's just, you know, people live their life in cities in villages uh, in in at work and different settings and to be in their settings is like just connecting with them much easier than than being in an isolated place or in a place that people don't know right. because if they have not a, if they don't have a church background they might have never been in a church right. and for them mentally to make that step it's a huge step for them yeah but on the street or in a taxi or that's that's something that they know and i think Maybe the short answer also is many people just wouldn't listen if you just preach, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very short way to put it. Yeah, many would say, what is this? They, they would not be able to connect. So you're in the business of translating the good exactly. news into terms that people will understand. That's it. It's a translation process. Yeah. yeah. What's your greatest hope for Stimmer and the ministry that you're doing? You know, my greatest hope, and it's actually not only a hope, but we see that in the lots of responses that we receive from people daily through the phone, email, that we touch their lives. But the most important thing really is that they get in touch with God, with Jesus, and that they decide for Jesus Christ, for God, and therefore live a more meaningful and more fulfilled life. And uh, that's what drives us. That's what, what is uh, really what we are passionate about. Yeah. Now, you're passionate about it. You, uh, you've been involved in media ministry for how long, personally? Uh, personally, now for at least 10 years, yeah. Okay. I have a media background. I, I studied uh, graphic designs and communication, but uh, I worked in a commercial agency. That was media, but now with church for 10 years, yes. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for sharing with us today. Pleasure. And please remember media ministries around the world, and particularly in places such as Germany, where so many people are rich and increased with goods and they feel as if they have need of nothing. And we need the Holy Spirit, we need the power of the media, we need human beings who are following Jesus to share the love of Jesus in very practical ways. We'll be right back straight after this message. Welcome back to the historic city of Mainz, Germany. And we continue our journey to various parts of the world to see how the Seventh-day Adventist Church is using various media to touch the lives of people where they live and where they work. Next up, Gina Wallin visits South Sudan and 94 Salvation FM. Thank you, Gary. We're here in South Sudan and I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing you to Dominic. Dominic is the chair of the only Seventh-day Adventist radio station here in the country of South Sudan. Dominic, yes. could you tell us how did the vision for this radio station, 97 Salvation FM, how did it begin? Well, the vision of this radio started with our retired pastor, Pastor Fulgenzi Okayo and uh, he thought that it was good for the ministry to be accomplished quicker by having uh, a radio station and television at the same time. But the government gave us a license for the radio station until the radio is on, then they can be able to give us a television uh, license. 
So this is how it all began, and he began to uh, actually give these things from his family, he start contributing from there and bring it to the church. And the church board form a formal committee that uh, I am part of, and then to see the work continue to go ahead. Now I heard something about loudspeakers on the top of his uh, house. Could you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, the <laughs> time he began, he was imitating what Muslims were doing, having horny speakers on their mosques. And they are, every morning at 6, they begin to uh, share a message. And people wake up and disturb people around, sleep, no sleep well. So she's, he also bought his uh, loud speakers, these uh, horny speakers, and put them on a tree. And then his room has become his uh, broadcasting uh, room, where he broadcast from, the living room. And then many people listen early in the morning at 6, they wake up to listen to the message. And from there, that's when he began to think we need to develop this just more than these uh, horny speakers at home to a frequency and go wider. And so now you have gone wider. And how is the community here in South Sudan, how have they reacted to Salvation FM radio? Well, the community are very much blessed. And it is the only radio station that gives a pure, clean music. Music, Christian music, not mixed with any other secular music. And they also give a, a spiritual uh, messages that builds people and give hope and family life and health. All these messages, you can't get them in the other radio station. That's why we became very much popular in the country. And can you tell us about some of the feedback, some of the reactions that you have heard of community people who have listened to the radio station and what, how it has changed their lives? Well, uh, some of them have been hearing to this message and some of them came to the radio and uh, get some counsels for their marriages that are broken. Some of them, they have been prayed for. For a long time, they are not giving birth, like a woman having 17 years. But after being prayed for, she came with the child to the church to, de to be dedicated. And uh, we have one uh, presenter now working with us who also came through the radio and got baptized. And now we trained him, and he got his certificate from AWR, and now he is working here with us in the program for the youth. And so we are very much blessed with uh, what the radio is doing to the community. Most of them even like our international program, which we relate from Hope Channel directly. And these programs are programs for uh, Mark Findlay, uh, programs that are for Sabah School, uh, Hope Sabah School, and programs also for Elder Douglas. Uh, these programs, people like them so much and they always attend to these programs and some preachings that are coming from Hope Channel. We have that slot in our radio. Fantastic. Yes. Now this radio station that started in this pastor's home with loudspeakers on, in the trees. Yes. Um, I see you are no longer broadcasting from the trees, but from this lovely building. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about what this is and how you've transformed it? Well, this uh, shipping container, we, uh, our former chairperson, uh, Pastor Clement, when he was the associate country director for ADRA. So he requested from ADRA so that we can be able to start, to begin. It was hard to collect money at the same time to get frequency, to get equipment from US based company, and then uh, uh, to build a house for the radio. So we just thought we can be able to start with this container, fabricate it into three rooms, we have the control room where all the machines and the controller sit. And then we have an on-air studio, which is in the middle. And then we have a reception uh, uh, slot for reception to host our guests that will come before they go to their time for the studio. So we had to paint it, and it has to communicate to itself. by uh, When somebody comes here, he knows this is uh, 94. Zero Salvation FM, the voice of hope, and the contacts are all here. So, and then we had to put a roof because this is a container. Somehow this roof reduces the level of heat 
that also comes in. So this roof we have put here so that we can be able to uh, at least see that uh, it's a bit cooler. And then the AC, we have put ACs and to put also the soundproof inside. So the room is, the temperature is very cold as any, anywhere, any building. So how creative. You take a shipping container yeah. and you transform it into a wonderful radio station for Salvation. Salvation FM, you paint it, yes. you put your information, a roof over it, and you're ready to go. Yes, and then on the, by the 12th of, uh, the, the 1st of, the 1st of uh, December 2012, that's the day that we went on air. Okay. Yeah, and each year we celebrate because of what God has done uh, well, through all of us Dominic, in the ministry. Thank you so much for being with us and for sharing what you're doing here in South Sudan. Amen. And, thank uh, you. It's been a privilege, and I bounce it now back to you, Gary. Thanks, Gina. As you can see, Mission is on the move through print, radio, television, and so many other means. Our last stop on today's program is the country of Switzerland, the place where the first official Seventh-day Adventist missionary, Pastor J.N. Andrews, was sent. I realize words like rogue and missionary don't seem like they should go together. But Michael Tchaikovsky was like Indiana Jones or Han Solo. He was, and I quote, a stubborn, impetuous man who refused to take advice from Ellen White. History gives us the sense that he was a charismatic swindler. Yet without him, many Adventists would have gone on believing what the Review and Herald printed in 1869. Quote, it may not be necessary to preach the gospel in any country besides our own, since our land is composed of people from almost every nation. End quote. If we reach the immigrants within the U.S., they'll witness to their friends and families overseas. The Great Commission will fulfill itself. The church's first big push for foreign missions came in 1871, when GC delegates voted to send J.G. Matson to witness to the Scandinavians and Danes of Wisconsin. Tchaikovsky, however, was no Millerite. He was an ex-Catholic Polish priest turned obsessive Sabbatarian. He was young, idealistic, fluent in seven or eight languages, and terrible with money. James and Ellen White were so besotted by his personality that they helped him pay all his debts and funded his travel from Battle Creek back to New York. Later, Ellen would receive a vision telling her to stop supporting him. Tchaikovsky left a wake of burnt bridges and bad business deals behind him. Though he hated taking advice, he didn't mind taking money. So when the SDA church wouldn't support him as a missionary to Europe, he found another denomination that would. Tchaikovsky used their money to share Adventist beliefs in Switzerland. However, he failed to inform the Swiss congregation of the home church in America. It wasn't until a church elder found a copy of the Review and Herald that Tchaikovsky's secret came out. The congregation was shocked. Naturally, their trust was bruised. The Swiss leaders wrote to the GC asking for a replacement missionary. Adventist historian David Trim writes, Adventists in America were actually sort of embarrassed to learn that there were already Adventist believers in Europe. The Americans invited the Swiss Adventists to send a delegate to the 1869 GC session. Though he arrived too late for the session, he stayed long enough to return as an ordained minister. Elsewhere, Tchaikovsky's tactics finally caught up to him. His bankroll was revoked. Disgraced, he left his family and moved to Hungary, where he would later die at 57 reportedly from exhaustion. But the Swiss church still sought a missionary, and that is how John Nevins Andrews became the first official Seventh-day Adventist missionary to Europe, as a replacement for the rogue missionary. The spirit of spreading the three angels' message began to intensify within the Seventh-day Adventist church. Even J.G. Matson got to move on from the wilds of Wisconsin to his home country of Denmark. His work would lead to the first international Adventist conference, the Scandinavian Publishing House, and Matson Institute in Meissen, Norway. The American Adventist church was beginning to catch a glimpse of the possibilities. The gospel preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The world church. But we still lacked a key component.
Well, thanks so much for joining us on today's program. And I hope that you've been inspired and challenged by what you've seen and heard. Here in Mainz, Germany, we see the tremendous history going right back to Gutenberg and his printing press. And it reminds us of the importance of media, of communication. And we've been as far as South Sudan and various places of the globe where the good news about Jesus Christ is being shared in very creative ways. And thank you so much for your continuing support of mission through your prayers, through your personal finances, and through your own involvement. Before we go, you may have been wondering what I'm holding in my hands here. Well, these are chopsticks, and I'd like to send you a pair. Uh, these are not expensive, but they're a little reminder of mission. And so next time you're eating your tofu or stir-fried vegetables or whatever, you can remember mission. It has the Adventist Mission website on it to, to remind you. Well, thanks so much for joining us on today's program, and I hope that you can join us next time right here on Mission 360.